Welcome to our first episode. In this episode, we're going to take a look at how we can examine the security settings and configuration of routers and switches that we may find in our environment. In particular, we're going to be taking a look at a very handy open source tool, or previously open source tool, called Nipper. And even though it's become a commercial tool, not only is the commercial version still very useful, though it has a regular licensing fee, but you can still find very, very handy versions of the free version available on the internet. And there's even been a fork of the, inf of the original open source version that's being maintained out at Google Code. You can find some of that information in those links in the show notes for this particular webcast. To get started though, first of all, if you're working as an auditor, we're going to talk about logging into the router or switch, and it really is not likely that you would have the passwords to be able to do that. So when I talk about you simply do this or that, I'm really talking about the interaction that you would have with the administrator who's actually responsible for the device, who does have the right to log in and work with that particular uh, system. So to get started, perhaps we sit with that administrator and explain we're going to need to audit this device. And I've already got the Nipper tool here sitting out in a folder on my desktop. And well, that'll come into play in just a little while. To get started though, we ask the administrator to log in so that we can see some things about the configuration. And he begins perhaps by starting up and opening up a command prompt. Now already we may have uh, some cause for concern here. Because if he immediately begins by opening a command prompt, particularly on Windows, that tells me that he's probably going to be using Telnet to connect to that switch or router. This is not necessarily a good thing. You see, Telnet, of course, is going to be unencrypted communication across the network. And he's going to be logging in to do administrative tasks. So that already shows us that there's a little bit of a finding. In any event, he brings up this command prompt and begins by Telnetting over to that router. So there it is. We can see that we have a problem already. So perhaps we make a note. We may even inquire. Do you realize that that's not encrypted? Is there a reason you're not using an encrypted form? Perhaps there's no requirement he, he has, or perhaps he's not aware of a requirement. Once he types that in, and it brings us to the router login page, we have another cause for concern. Now what we've seen so far, just these two things, are actually extremely common to see. The first is the unencrypted access. The second is, notice that it is simply prompting for a password. This is a problem because now there's no accountability. If someone knows what the password is, they can log in, and everyone who works with this device uses the same password to log in. So if something is done incorrectly, or, or perhaps unauthorized changes are made, there is no way to figure out who did it. In this particular case, though, there is something that can be done. In most of our higher-end router and switch products, this one included, it's possible to tie the authentication back into the centralized authentication systems we have in our, our organization. For example, if you have Kerberos or, or Radius perhaps available through your Windows domain, then you can simply have your routers and switches require that you use your Windows credentials to log in to do your maintenance tasks. It's still possible to have an emergency password, but now when the administrator logs in, not only do they have to know a password, but it's their password and it's associated with their username. So all of the actions can now be accounted for and we know who's doing what. This also solves the problem of not or failing to change the passwords when people leave the organization or for any other reason. I've taken too long talking here, so I need to tell that back in. And let me start by typing in the password. Let me see if I can remember this one. Okay, I got that one right. In this particular case, notice that the prompt for this device is telling me what type of device it is. Now that's not typical. That's simply how this one is configured. In the configuration file, you can control what that prompt will be. And here, the administrator chose to tell you what type of device you have. This is a Cisco 3512XL switch. So it's a catalyst switch. The very first thing that I would want this administrator to do is show me what version of the iOS I'm running. Now, I accidentally mistyped that. And when you do 
do and make an error of some sort, notice that it will give you a marker to show where the problem is. But there's something else that's very handy in this particular type of device and Cisco devices. If you're not sure what to type next, you can simply hit a question mark and it will show you all of the context-based options that you could now enter. And what I'm looking for is the word version. So I'll simply begin typing that and hit the tab key and it will auto-complete out. When he shows me the version, I find some other things that cause some concern for me. One of the things that I'd be looking for, one of the reasons that I'm asking him for him to do this, is so that I can see this information right up here. Notice that the copyright date is from 86 through 2000, and that the compilation date of this particular version of the iOS that's running is July 17th of 2000. So the iOS running on this particular device is nearly 12 years old. I like to look at these because looking at the version number may not make a lot of sense to you. Who knows what version they're up to today for this particular device. But looking at the compilation date gives you a lot of very fast information. Now why would a device that hasn't been patched in so long still be running? Well, when we talk about switches or routers, we find that administrators, they only really tinker with these devices when there's something not working. And as long as this device is working successfully, no one's going to mess with it. Also, they tend to put more focus on the routers than they do on the switches, even though they're really just as smart. In this particular case, there's another reason why this is still in existence. Notice that it has uh, 1200 megabit ports and two gigabit ethernet ports. So it's using the gigabit ethernet ports as uplink ports into the rest of the infrastructure. But since this organization has not yet moved gigabit out to all of the desktops, this is still a perfectly sufficient device to have in the organization. Well, what's our next step? Now we want to see how it's actually configured. To find that out, we're going to have to use the enable command in order to move into the privileged mode. So again, the administrator needs to enter in, well, depending how it's configured, either a local password or, again, maybe that centralized authentication. And notice that the prompt changes. Now rather than the greater than sign, I have the pound sign. The pound sign indicating that I'm now a super user. With that done, I'm going to take a look at two different configurations. There is both a running configuration and a startup configuration. Let's start by showing the running config. Now when I do that, it will show it a page at a time. But what I'm going to do here is not analyze it in this screen. What I really need to do is get a copy of it over to my computer. Now there are lots of ways to do this. In this particular case, I'm going to choose to simply copy and paste it right out of here. So I'm not sure if that copied or not. Let's see what we have over in Notepad. All right. So there we have it. And there's everything we've typed so far. So this is it. And I'm going to begin by chopping out the stuff that is not really part of the configuration. So I'm going to start at the top here and chop out all of this. That all goes. And, okay, we'll just leave that initial comment line. And then when I come down to the bottom here, I'll also chop out everything after the word end. Okay. Then I'll save that file. And I'm going to save it into the directory where I have the Nipper tool, because I'm going to use Nipper to analyze these tools, these configurations, in just a minute. So I'll call this running config. And let me close that up. And now, just, to, just for simplicity, I'm going to log out of the router and I'm going to exit out of my command prompt because I don't want to accidentally copy my startup config and my running config at the same time. So I'm going to telnet back in and again log in with the password. Go right into the enable mode. Enter that password again and this time I'm going to show the startup config. So why are there two configurations? Well, the reason that there are two configurations is that when we look at our um, when we look at our configuration, when the user logs in and makes some changes live, that's all happening to the running config. 
But what if they make a mistake? Perhaps that mistake even locks them out of the router. Well, the start of config remains unchanged unless the administrator saves his changes down to the startup config. Let me take this startup config and, and put it out here too, and then we'll talk about it a little bit more and, and see what sorts of things can happen. So I'll paste this in, and let's see. We want to make sure that we have actually copied the new one. So I'll look at the bottom. That's clean. And up at the top here, notice that we, we don't have all the show version stuff. So I've definitely got the right startup configuration. I can see it right there. And let me copy this or, or uh, delete this out. All right. So now the startup and the, the startup configuration is, is nice and clean. That's the only thing in the file. I'll save that. Close up Notepad. And at this point, we can actually log out of the router because there's very little that we would still need to do at the router level unless there's a problem found of course and that becomes something for the administrator to address so I've got that nipper tool here on my desktop so I'm going to go right into that directory and we're going to do two different things here the first thing is I'd like to simply run a difference against the startup and running configurations now, looking at the files, I can see right away that they're actually a different size. So that's a bad sign. Let me try File Compare, Running Config, Startup Config. And here's what it shows me. Rather than going line by line to figure out what's different, by running it this way, I can see right away what's changed. I see in the Running Config, we have an, we have an access list defined, access list 10, permitting certain hosts to do something that doesn't exist in the startup config. In the running config I find that it has a strong password set but in the startup config it does not. In the running config it's also using an access class. Now access class 10 refers to access list 10. Cisco is a little bit odd this way. Just a rule of thumb is if you see a command that begins with the word access then you are probably looking at an access list, whether you're defining it or you're using it. And in this case, it's being applied, it's being used. So it's applying this access list to the Telnet interface to prevent anyone that is not in this subnet from being able to log in. In the organization, this would be perhaps the subnet where the network engineers or the security administrators uh, live. Those lines are missing from the startup configuration. Similarly, we have some other virtual terminals, 5 through 15, also configured with the same strong password and the same access class, but that is not being applied here to the startup config. This is a major finding and not that unusual. An administrator logged in, made changes. In this case, perhaps they were even in response to an audit finding, but they failed to save those, set those settings. So now, what are the settings looking like today? Well, our next step is to use the Nipper tool itself. Nipper I have here in this directory, and I'm just going to run Nipper with help. Nipper will allow you to look at the configurations for many different systems. Things like, um, like Cisco devices, whether they're switches or routers. They can look at uh, checkpoint devices. They can look at uh, net screen devices or Juniper devices. So it's a really, really useful tool, and it's pretty easy to use. Let's run a com uh, report here first against the startup config. So we simply define an input of startup config.txt and an output I'm going to set to uh, startup.html or start.html. And that's it. It is a fast tool. Once that's done, I'll simply open up the Nipper directory and we find in there this start.html file because it produces this really easy to use HTML based report. In looking at the report, it's got some of the standard things you'd expect to find in an audit report. For instance, we have the table of contents with what the conventions are in this document and, and an introduction to it. And, and I'm going to scroll through most of this pretty fast. I'll put this example up on the show notes as well. If you'd like to read through it, you can have access to it. But I'm going to scroll down to where the findings are. Now here's the first set of findings. The first one is it says you've got users with dictionary-based password. This is a high issue, impact is critical, easy to fix, and it's quick. 
and down here it shows what it found. It found that the password in the start of configuration is password. That's really bad. Let's scroll down a little bit more. Dictionary-based SNMP. So it tells you exactly what issues it's finding, how serious they are, and how hard they are to fix. Here's another one. Clear text Telnet service enabled. In this case it says, wow, this is a really big problem. It's easy to exploit, but wow, it's involved to fix. The reason is that in this case it would require you to actually upgrade the iOS. Now here's one of the problems. In this case, the Cisco 3512 that we have here, there is no version of, S of, of the iOS available for this switch that supports SSH. So how can we handle a problem like that? Well, there's two, pro two ways to do it. One is we could move to a, perhaps encrypted S SNMP, which is unpleasant but possible. Perhaps we could use IPsec tunnels to the device. That would work rather well. Perhaps an out-of-band connection. Maybe one of the ports set into a VLAN on a private network that no one else can access. So there are ways we can fix it. The best way to do it, though, is when you have a piece of hardware that's this old, for which there are no upgrades available anymore, you should just be replacing the hardware. Well, that's all the time that we have for today. But if you've enjoyed this, this uh, podcast, we'd love to hear from you. If you have suggestions for other episodes, please let us know. In the show notes, we'll include this sample report and also information on where you can find this older version of the Nipper tool and the source code for the open source version that's available.